o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. We've got lots of cool stuff to talk about tonight. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. So I'm just so excited to see some familiar faces over here the first night because it's always so encouraging when I see people on the first night and they actually come back. So that's a good thing. Do not drop this music real quick. So you guys feel like you're drinking from a fire hose? Yes. That's the way it's supposed to be. We're trying out a new microphone gadget, and I feel like that guy at the fair that is sitting back and showing you how to, how to use the Pepto knives and how to use the pans. So we're going to try that out and see how it works. Okay, a couple things before we get started. First of all, make sure you get your test from last time so you can work on your test again tonight. I've also got a sign-up sheet here for you. How many of you signed up for your, for your bees so far? Okay. How many of you still need to sign up for your bees? There you go. Here's the list you're going to want. And I'm going to put it over here with Elizabeth, our treasurer. So if you want bees, we need your name, your phone number, and then the number of packages that you want. And it's the Italian bees that you can sign up for now. They did order some carniolans, uh, but that order is already complete. Every, all the bees that they could get of that flavor are now sold. So if you want Italians, and man, I'm so much feeling like QVC right now. So if, um, so if you want bees, Italians is the flavor that you're going to get this time. So there's that. So um, let's see, any announcements? Ted? Yes, yeah. Announcements? Sort of be a short class. It's going to be a, a, a melding tonight. We're going to do an hour class, and then we're going to have our normal Tuesday, third Tuesday meeting of the association, where we often have speakers. Tonight we're going to have Brandon Williams, who's the American president, basically giving a presentation on beekeeping from 50,000 foot view, which will be sort of across the world, across history. We'll talk about Pliny, talking about how the Romans kept bees, we'll look at how the Egyptians kept bees and still do. And so that will be happening in the second hour. We highly encourage you to hang out. It's, it's basically, Brandon's been working on this and it's been aimed sort of at, at the beginning beekeeper as well as club members. So there's something in for, for everyone. Please stay and enjoy. Good. So no show or presentation could happen unless there was an advertisement. And so tonight, so tonight, I'd like to run an advertisement. And the advertisement is for an upcoming bee class that goes by a couple of names. The first, uh, we call it beekeeping in the Pacific Northwest, which is an excellent class for you to take after this class. It's also known as advanced beekeeping. And the first year that we ran it and called it advanced beekeeping, we had, a lot of, we had a lot of people that didn't go to the class because they were afraid, wow, advanced. Oh, that's, I'm not advanced. I'm not going to go to that. So that's why we change it to beekeeping in the Pacific Northwest. It's totally a class you guys should be going to. Now that you've done this, between now and the time that it starts, and the, it's going to be held on June 27th, so it's an all-day Saturday, something like 8.30 to 6 or 6.30. So come prepared to learn a lot of cool stuff. It'll definitely take you to, your, to the next level in your beekeeping experience. So plan to do that, but here is the commercial on that. Beekeeper, so I find that when you first become a beekeeper, 
you read all the books, you read all the magazines. I can remember my first year, I didn't have any bees yet, but man, I had a handle on this beekeeping thing. Because I read every magazine note, man, I read every book in the library, and I knew exactly what I was going to do with bees. And I knew it all right up until the point that my bees are off. And of course, all that went out the window. But I continued to learn and study, and I continued through the first and second year thinking, oh man, I still got this in wire. Well, now I'm entering my fourth year, and I don't have a clue. So what I'm going to share with you tonight is swarming. We're going to be, we're going to be on chapter 5, page 22. And it's swarming. So I'm going to share with you some stuff. Think of beekeeping as an onion. And when you cut into an onion, you have all those layers. That's what beekeeping is about. There's so many layers to the whole thing called beekeeping. So tonight I'm going to share with you maybe layer one or layer two. I guarantee you there are people here in the room that know a whole lot more about swarming or how to prevent swarming. Seek those people out. You're going to have an opportunity to cross-pollinate with other beekeepers tonight because, as George had mentioned, or, or uh, Ted mentioned, we're going to have the, uh, the club meeting afterwards. Ask all these kinds of questions. If you want to know how to prevent swarming, I'm going to show you a couple of ways, but ask people who do it every day. We've got some pretty serious beekeepers for you. So, let me jump into the presentation part. So, here's the deal with beekeeping, and maybe you're already starting to sense this. If you line up 10 beekeepers and ask their opinion on something, I promise you're going to get at least 20 opinions. And the reason why is because not only do we, have, do we change our minds a lot, not only do we one season try one thing and figure, well, that didn't work, so the next season try something else, but I think as a, as a group, we're pretty schizophrenic. You know, some years we do something, some years we do something, that's something else, so just run with it. Somebody will give you an answer, try it for yourself. Don't be afraid to experiment. This is kind of a fun, fun hobby for that. So, um, so just jump in and try it. Any one of the topics that we cover can just get so in depth. That's one of the things that attracted me to these people, is that there are just so many facets. I mean, you can take bee biology or communication through pheromones, larva development, housekeeping, and roles that different bees play, construction of, bee, of high bee diseases, any one of those you can spend a whole lot of time just studying and getting into. And so take that aspect. As you go into the hobby, really dig into the things that excite you and get you jazzed up about. So tonight we're going to spend about an hour. That's what I've got, an hour to cover this fascinating topic that you could literally spend hours or days talking about. So a couple of things I want you to be sensitive to as you go through is during this presentation, I'm going to be talking about uh, how to make a split or how to, how to uh, raise queens or talking about queens. One of the unique things about our club is we get into that kind of stuff. In the Advanced Beekeeping in the Northwest, or Advanced Beekeeping class, also known as Pacific Beekeeping in the Northwest, we teach you how to do splits. So get into that. Learn how to do that. We have a queen rearing group and a queen, and a queen rearing class. So get into that if that excites you. And you don't have to do it all your first year. So don't feel overwhelmed. Don't feel like, oh my god, I've got to run down and do, it all. do all this stuff. Take your time. Each year, add something new to your brain. Try something else with your hives, and just see how fun things go. So, shout out some answers. When we talk about swarm, what do you guys think about? Large cluster bees that don't have a home. That gal's been reading. What else do we think about? Taking bees from your own hive. Taking bees from your own hive. What else do you think about? Minimum stinging. Minimum stinging. Good. Okay, what else? <laughs> Losing your bees. Okay, what else? Three bees. Three bees. Totally. Three bees. Okay. So, I can already tell this group, because I've taught this in the past, usually what they call out are things like uh, scary and uh, oh my gosh, we're all going to die, or we're all going to get stung to death. So, good. You guys are already way ahead on that. So. What you're going to see is you're going to see some real commonalities within our hives. Um, as you look at them, no matter what they look like on the outside, you're going to see that they have a lot of similarities. You've already started seeing some of the magazines and books that you've been reading, that they come in all kinds of sizes, shapes, colors. There's um, traditional hives like those. There's top bar, there's top bar hives like these. Uh, and as they are throughout the world, they come in, as I say, different just shapes, logs, whatever. But it doesn't matter what your hives look like on the outside, they all share some real commonalities on the inside. So one of the things that the hives do is they swarm. And they wind up looking like this. 
So let's fly through a, a swarm. And what I'd like to do for a moment is talk a little bit about when these guys swarm. So typically, bees are going to swarm when it's least convenient to you, I promise. You're going to be heading off to church, your car's going to be packed, and you're going to be going on vacation, and you look up at your hives for one last moment, and you're going to see them swarm. Man. So it's typically going to be the, first time, the worst time for you. Uh, I think they've got a little alarm clock or maybe a shipyard whistle in there, because they all know to go at one time. And typically, when they're going to swarm is between 11 and 2 p.m. Why they do that, I don't know. That's one of the wonderful things about beekeeping. There are a lot of mysteries. They get all organized. They have a meeting. They say, OK, what time do you want to go? And then they just pick a time and go. They can land almost anywhere. So, And we'll get into what you should look for when a uh, hive is getting ready to swarm. But they go through a process in which they start building up. And they actually start communicating. And there's times that they'll actually put their queen on a diet. Because queens, typically after they're mated and they're in the hive, they get a lot larger than the other bees, so much so that they don't fly. So if indeed they're working up to a swarm, they will often put their queens on a diet, so they slim down. So for those of you that put uh, queen guards on the front of your hives, although that is a technique, because often the queens are, are slimmed down by her, by her hive, often they'll be able to get through that. So not a foolproof item. But the whole point is, get her slimmed down so that she can fly. And they're not going to fly too far away. They're usually going to fly out, and they're going to land on the first thing that they can, they can come to light on. So let's fly through a swarm. <coughs> so if you ever have a chance to walk around when there's a swarm like this, it's actually a lot of fun. And if you just stand there, don't be swatting at them, don't be none of, that, none of that stuff. But if you're just out there walking among them and they're swarming, it's a pretty amazing feeling because you realize just how small you are, and even though they're small, how big they are because of their mass number. And yes, there's always that niggling little thing in the back of your head that says, oh my god, what if they turn against me? But that's just part of beekeeping. You'll get over that and you'll work your way through. So typically when the hive swarms, the first one out is called a prime swarm, and it typically takes, the prime swarm takes your queen with you. So the queen will go, and about half the colony will go with them. What the queen leaves behind and the colony leaves behind is enough brood so that the new colony can create another uh, queen. Often, they've already begun that process by building a swarm comb. So we'll talk a little bit about what the swarm comb looks like here in a moment. So when, when, your, uh, when the swarm does happen, this is kind of what it looks like. It can be anywhere, on anything. You're lucky if it's something like this. There's no ladders involved, nothing crazy going on. You can just pretty much walk up to them and scoop them into whatever you're going to catch them on. Cityscape stuff all the time. So more and more urban beekeepers are popping up. People are putting beehives on roofs in, uh, in cities and in towns. And so you're going to see more of this. And you'll see bees flying around. I mean, try it sometime. You're walking over in Seattle, Cement City, and you see a dandelion in the crack of a sidewalk, and you see a bee on it. And just stop and look around and say, where did that dude come from? You know, where, where could that be living? Well, wherever they're living, they're going to swarm at some point, because that's a natural behavior of bees. And this is what you'll see if you're in a city type setting. So why do bees swarm? Again, part of it's a mystery. I mean, all that's a great. One of the great things about beekeeping is it's not all figured out. You know, if, if you get into many other hobbies, or I mean, I don't know, pick a hobby, it's, it's all figured out. They got it in the Olympics. People train for it. Well, beekeeping is still really mysterious. And any one of you, through your own observation and your own note-taking, could discover something about bees that nobody else has ever discovered. So that's, again, one of the fascinating things about, uh, about beekeeping. But some reasons that uh, bees do swarm is because they're too crowded. So imagine, in the natural setting, you've got a bunch of bees that are in a trunk of a tree. They're in a forest. They're all fat and happy, and they've got lots of nectar coming in. Their natural instinct is to say, wait a minute, this is all cool, but what if we have a forest fire? So maybe we should split off, divide, so let's swarm. That way now we've got two colonies. So it's a way for the bees to procreate, to continue to grow. 
And so, um, and so we look at it as beekeepers and say, okay, what are some of the things that we might see that are leading up to it? So two private visits. So if you open up your beehive, you, you uh, take one of the boxes off, and the bees are just overflowing, and there's bees covering every frame. There's no place else for the bees to uh, lay eggs or bring in additional uh, resources. They're going to start thinking that they, need, that they need a new home. Uh, poor queen is the reason why they, uh, they will swarm. Running out of storage, so again, honey bound, that's back to running out of space. So you figure the, the, the bees need three things. So think of a little apartment, right? You've got some basic things you need. Well, with bees, you've got, you need room for your brood, you need room for honey, so that's where you get your uh, carbohydrates, and you need room for the pollen that you're bringing in. Right? So that's the protein. So you got to have all of those. And if you run out of room, and you remember, how many eggs is the queen laying each day? A couple thousand. A couple thousand eggs a day when they're coming, right? So you got to have the room for it. So if they're all of a sudden sensing this home isn't big enough, it's time to you do something or the bees will do something. Uh, and then poor conditions. So if bees are in their... Uh, in the hive, and everything is looking good, except it's drafty, it's cold, there's a lot of moisture. If it's kind of a broken down hive, maybe it's an older hive that you inherited, they're not going to like that either. I mean, they need a nice, tight environment uh, in which to grow. Yeah. So again, at the core of, of swarming is survival. It's nothing you did. If your hives swarm, it's nothing you did. Now, maybe it's something you didn't do, but some people say, just let them swarm. Other people say, no way, I'm not going to let them swarm because swarming costs me time and money. So we'll get into some things that you can do perhaps to offset a swarm. So signs of impending swarm. So we've talked about the conditions under which a swarm might be needed. Uh, you might be seeing a swarm, but, or that the hive is getting ready to swarm the conditions. But fast buildup of population. So when do you usually see a huge population boom in your house? Spring, absolutely. So you're going to be getting your, your uh, bee packages here in another month or so. From then on, the potential for swarming is imminent because they're going to be growing. They're going to be going from a little three pound package with about 10,000 bees up to 60, 70, 80,000 bees. And so there's going to be this big upswing. So you need to keep up with that if you want to prevent swarming. So if you start seeing this huge buildup of population, that's a little flag to say, okay, this is a swarming uh, issue. If they have no more room to grow, we talked a little bit about that. If they've maxed out the one box that you bought, because that's what some magazine told you, have one box and you're good to go. That's not true. You need to have a couple extra boxes. But if you max out on that box, no room to go, you're in trouble. Swarm cell production. And in a moment, I'll have some pictures here to show what swarm cells look like. And also, the next thing you're going to need is nectar flow. Typically, the bees are not going to swarm unless there's plenty of food out there for them. Yes, they'll gorge on all the honey that they can get before they swarm, and they'll take as much they can, as they can with them, little to-go boxes, and they're flying around with little to-go boxes of honey. So they're gorged on all the honey, um, but they need to know that there's going to be plenty of nectar coming in when they get to, when they get to their location. So this is an example of a swarm cell. So a swarm cell is usually at the, at the edge or the bottom of your frame. So if you pull your frames out and look at them and you see one of these on the bottom, this is a swarm cell. It means that the, that the colony has taken an, a regular egg, they've built a little extra uh, space for them, and now they're feeding it extra royal jelly to create a queen. So something's going on in the colony. If you see a swarm cell, you, and you've got to ask yourself what's going on in this colony that would cause our bees to create a swarm cell. Here's the other kind of cell you'll run across, and this is called a supersedure cell. So you'll see these almost any time of the year, but what this tells you is that there's something going on with the queen. That the, uh, the colony has said, okay, queen, you're not up to standards. We need to start thinking about replacing you. Which is always a fun conversation because often the thinking is, well, the queen runs the hive, right? Well, no, it's a symbiotic relationship. One feeds the other. The queen certainly does her job, but she's only queen as long as the workers let her be the queen. So, uh, so if you see something like this, you know that, again, your colony is telling you something. Something's going on within the hive. It's up to you as a beekeeper and the mere human to figure out what these complex little guys are, 
trying to figure out. Yes, sir. So in the previous slide, yeah, you said that that was the, the kind of a, a symptom of a, an impending, or possibly an impending swarm. Yeah, that, that's so called a swarm cell. What's the difference between that and, and the other one that you showed? And that one? I mean, you can see the difference, but I don't understand it. So, so the swarm cells are typically at, along the bottom. So a great way, and you'll see a picture in a moment, but a great way to see those is if you've got your boxes, you pick up the box and look underneath. Right. And sometimes you'll see swarm cells. The supersedure cell is in the middle of the of the hive somewhere. But they're both extra queens. They're both new queens, right? Yes. And why they do that, I don't know. I mean, if there's somebody that this is just a pattern that's been noticed. When you see them on the bottom, maybe it's swarming. If you see it there, they're just going to replace the one queen that you got. Correct. Not likely to be a swarm. Right. Well, I mean, there's still could be. Now, yeah. Right. So, so one of the rules: the bees don't read the same books that we do. You know, they do their own thing. We think we know what's going on. So. Could the bees put together one of these and then go and swarm? Absolutely. <coughs> no, they figure out their own thing. So, what kind of cell is this? Okay. And what kind of cell is that? Cool. Good. You got that done. Awesome. Question? Yeah. On the one slide you showed there were two uh, swarm cells. Is it possible there would be more than one supersedure cell? Uh, you can see multiple su supersedure cells, sure. So you, if you went in, if you saw one supersedure cell, Chances are you're going to find others because the condition or the cons the concern is within the hive that they need to replace, and often they're not going to do it just one because that one might not make it. Right. Um, but, yes. Um, back up for a second. You mentioned about having um, more roosters in one hand in case you need them. Every picture I've ever seen on uh, Line Trout Five has two deep roosters. Did you ever? time to put the third one on there, or does two deep ones contain a hive? So no rules. There's, um, uh, so typically, so when you get, when you get your, uh, your package of bees, you're probably better off just to have one box. Let them grow into it, let them, and then you put the second one on. And then from there you probably put on um, shallows if you wanted to collect honey. Typically the hive is going to do well with two deeps. That's just fine with that. Is there a time that you ever put on a third deep? Suppose I've not seen that, but you know, here again, you've got to try to interpret what those guys are saying to you, and then kind of react to it. I would suggest that if, if you if you've got to a point where your population is so big that you think you need to add a third bee, you probably need to talk about splitting up. Yeah. Something that, that they say that they figured out is that when a when a swarm looks for a hive, their optimal size is about 40 liters or 10 gallons or so. They show you two five-gallon buckets worth of space they're looking for. You look at the size of two deep, that's pretty close to the same sort of thing. So that's that's that, that's what makes the bees happy. They'll they'll go in more or less, but uh, if you have less, you're probably going to want more. And so that's that's why the two deep winds up being pretty much accommodates, you know, as many bees as you're likely to have in a single hive. They, they can't take the whole size of a house though, you know, they point. Is it, is it just a volume thing so they can pour shallows in the place of two deep? Yes, they probably could. Good. Yeah. And, in other words, I, I have some eight frame eight frame um, uh, westerns that I use, and three eight frame westerns are about the same as one deep. So I, you know, when I when I put about, when I put these in, I put them three of those guys, and that's about enough for a for a small hive, and just start adding more and more. Just easier to add. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Well, looking at volume and surface area are a good thing to start doing if you do the under tandy keeping. How much surface area do they have for, for making home, and how much volume do they have for putting all that in? Sort of, sort of a calculation. So one of the benefits kind of going to that point, and it's easy to have a little cul de sac in the conversation. So one of the bits, so to the point of yes, you could have three or four shallows equal one deep. The drawback about that is the brood chamber is broken up because you know there's a seam between each of the each of the layers. And if you had to move it, you'd be breaking up the brood chamber. So granted, if that's all you've got, that's all you've got to make the best of it. But in a best world, I would say you'd be better off to have deeps because in that way the brood chamber is intact. You can move it and not mess with anything, and it's a little better environment. Okay, so we'll go back to these. So, I mentioned earlier, this is a great way to look for swarm cells. You're out working your bees, you just tip it over on the end, you can kind of look underneath, and this is where you're going to see the swarm cells on the bottom. So, uh, let's see, so we covered all that. Great. So, one of the things that I find about swarming, and I know pe different people have got different opinions about stuff, but at the end of the day, 
The bees aren't going to change their attitude, are they? It's going to be you that has to change your attitude. So one of the things that I try to take the Zen approach to swarming, in that it's going to happen. There's nothing you can do to stop them from wanting to swarm, but then you get to choose how you react based on your beekeeping philosophy. If I'm raising my bees to sell honey, to make splits, and I've got a bunch of hives, if a hive swarms, that costs me time and money. So I'm going to take actions to stop it from swarming. If, on the other hand, which I really am, just a hobbyist beekeeper, and you know, some years I have four hives, and some years, like this one, I got one hive, um, you know, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to play with them, and each year I'm going to do a little bit different, I'm going to try something different. Um, but you get to choose whether you want to aggressively try to prevent swarming, or if you just want to watch it happen and try to catch the swarm, or some of the other techniques. So, without going down too much of a rabbit hole, when I first started, again, I read all the books, so I knew everything about beekeeping. I chose my first year to go with Warre Hives. Now, I still have my Warre Hives, but I wouldn't have done that had I known what I know now. I would have started out with flying straw. And the reason why is because when you start trying to do splits, and when you start trying to integrate nukes and create nukes, there aren't those types of, that type of equipment have, isn't built for war a, and I'm not a big word worker guy. So I can't go into my shop and whip up a war a nuke, per se. So that's one of the reasons why I like Langstroth and why I typically recommend Langstroth for new beekeepers, because you've got all the equipment there to support it. You don't have to go out and build it. You just kind of roll with it. So back to the attitude, it's all about yours. So swarms are going to happen. You get to choose how you're going to react to it. So. This is one of those poems or one of those things. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change, to change things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Swarming, you can mess with it, but the bees are going to want to do it. Sort of like the teenager that's going to want to go out and get the trouble. Part of the deal. So, pros and cons to swarming. So, some of the pros to it, as a uh, young lady mentioned in the back, you just double up, you get three bees. So, if, you, if, you're, if your hive swarms and you're able to capture that swarm, Bring them back, put them in a box, now you've got two hives. You just divided it up. So that's a pro for it. Um, so great opportunity to uh, grow your apiary. The con, though, is that now you've got two weak hives. You've got the hive that it left that may just be bordering on queenless or maybe a queen right around the corner. So that slows down the whole thing. You've now got half the, half the colony there to collect resources. And then you've got this... This, the other half is on the wing. They don't even have a new house yet. And even if you do get them into a house, now you've got essentially a package of bees. So that's part of the con. And again, going back to if you want to do beekeeping to create honey or create any kind of revenue, that any time the bees slow down, that's costing you time and money. So there's some pros and cons, and it can, it can go either way. So let's get into what are some options that you've got. So you know the springs have been coming, and the hives are going to want to swarm. So what can we do to prevent? So one of the techniques that you can do is just go in and pinch all the swarm cells. You know, well, my wife doesn't let me do that. In fact, we don't even pinch queens. We have a queen retirement condo off to the side. So that's where they go, because that's how we roll, right? All good. So, so you could just go in and pinch the swarms. Well, the challenge is you pinch the swarm cells, but you still have the conditions and you still have the drive. The bees still want to go swarm. They have that need to swarm. And you've got the conditions, maybe overcrowded or what have you. So I would suggest just pinching the swarm cells isn't the answer. A cool thing to do with the swarm cells is collect them and maybe put them in other hives that don't have a queen. Or if you're intending to, to break out and do a, uh, uh, a split or something, that's a great way to, to get another queen for your group. There's a system called the Demeray system. Not only going to touch on a couple of these today. There are dozens of ways, right? And there's some out there that don't even have names that people just made up along the way. So the Demeray system is pretty cool because you're sort of faking the bees out so that way you make them think they already swarmed. And the way that you do that is you take all your boxes off and you're down to just your brood box. And then you have another deep right alongside it with all drawn out, um, all drawn out wax. You remove two frames from the middle of the new box. You grab two frames that have all the resources and brood from the original brood box and the queen and put her in the new box. You then take the two empty frames that you just took from the new box and you stick them on the edges of the bottom box. You 
throw, you throw a, a coin excluder on the original brood box, then you put a uh, couple of shallows, then another coin excluder, and then take this new box and put it at the top. And so now what you've got is you've got a queen up here with some brood. The, the worker bees will migrate up to her and cover the brood that's up there. She'll now, she's now got all kinds of real estate to lay eggs in. And then the uh, other bees will stay below to keep the brood warm that's down there and tend that brood. So now essentially you split the colony in half. The queen up on top, uh, there is no queen in the bottom. So now what do you do? Well, one way is just to let that go for a while. However, the queen scent may get out of the bottom box, and they may start thinking they're queenless, and so maybe they're going to start creating a queen. One of those things we just kind of have to watch, but it's called the Demery system. You can look it up. It's been around since the 1800s. Another cool thing about beekeeping, it's been around for a long time. The Demery comes back from the 1800s. Kind of a fun thing to play with, and it creates more opportunities. You could then take your Demery system and eventually just slowly split them apart, and now you've got two hives. So a lot of cool things you can do with it. Another one is called checkerboarding. And again, that's where you have your full brood box on the bottom. You take a brand new brood box of drawn comb. You take and you switch out. Um, you switch out the uh, the resources with a blank uh, with a blank undeveloped um, frame. So you, your bottom box would be resources clean, resources clean, resources clean, resources clean, and then the box you put on top of it is opposite, so that. So that it's the same thing, divide it up, but then the bottom one has resources, the top one doesn't. So that's called checkerboarding. It really it kind of messes with the bees because, whoa, what's going on? My, my brood's broken up. That's always a scary thing. But it's called checkerboarding. Again, been around for a while. Some people swear by it. Some people hate it. It's got some drawbacks. I don't personally like it because I don't like to do anything that really screws up the brood chamber. Because that, that's not a happy thing. We want the babies to be all happy. Want the bees to be all happy. So if I was going to pick one of the two, I, I like messing with the Demry system the best. Uh, let's see. So uh, then splitting. So decreases the population and adds to your apiary. So if you do go to the next beekeeping class, we teach you how to do a split, and there's a couple different methods even to do that. But the neat thing about a split is now you've created another colony, and you've added another queen. So you can either do that by using swarm cells, or the club usually has uh, queens that you can purchase. And so now you've got your split. And splits are a lot of fun because, again, it's a way of taking, you know, so you get your April and May. So about June, your bees are rocking and rolling. I mean, you've got 60, 70, 80,000 bees in your colony. Time to do a split. You put them in a little nuke. You get it going really nicely. You put that into a regular brood box. And before you know it, you're going with a whole other hive. So uh, you're going to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, so this is one that I, the next one, the turnoff split. Man, every year I say, I'm going to try this. It looks really cool, and it'd be great to videotape. So here's the deal with, uh, with the turn-off split. So you've got your hive that is just rocking and rolling, overflowing with all kinds of bees. There's, uh, they're, maybe they're getting full. Um, there's lots of nectar flow. The, what you do is you take and you lay out a sheet in front of your whole hive. You build this little ramp with a gap so that the bees can walk up the ramp and then either form in a cluster or jump across to the hive. And then what you do is you take your hive and you dump them all out onto the sheet. Now obviously you're gonna do this on a nice sunny day, no rain, you dump them all out on the sheet, wouldn't that be fun? And then you stack your boxes back up. And so now the bees are all out here saying, holy crap, what did you just do to me? Well they start forming up and they walk up this little ramp. The, the ones that are gonna take care of the brood, they jump back into the hive. That gets all populated. Then the ones that we're going to, that we're going to uh, swarm anyway collect underneath. You take that group and put them in another box, and you've just essentially done a split. What you've done is you've artificially instigated a swarm. You've kicked them all out and said, OK, guys, figure it out. So this is an example where YouTube and the internet can be a dangerous thing. Because I was a moderate beekeeper until I saw that, and now I want to try it. <laughs> So turn off, split, kick them all out, and figure it out. Um, so when it, so uh, one of the things you can do is start setting up swarm traps. That's a fun thing. I'll show you some pictures of those here in a minute. The other thing you can do is just let it happen. You know, they're going to fly, they're going to fly. I'm going to get, and I mean, this has happened to me a couple of years. The first year that I did it, it's like, okay, I've got too much going on in my life. I know i got my bees. They're going to swarm. I'll watch them. Whatever happens, well, they swarm. I didn't get the swarm. Okay, that didn't work so good. So the next year, I'm setting up swarm traps. So that's my, my way of doing it now. So 
Uh, although this year I want to get more into the splits. So this is a typical swarm uh, trap that you can buy pretty inexpensively. I think about 29 bucks or something. Those are the, the pressed, uh, pressed uh, paper, <coughs> like they make flower pots out of. Hanging up in the tree, I recommend putting in a little uh, piece of cloth with some lemon, uh, scent of lemon in there. Uh, even throw a chunk up, if you've got a chunk of comb, throw that in there too, so that way you have kind of a sense. Uh, and stick it in the tree and see what happens. Uh, for this guy, caught a nice swarm there. And some people go so far as to actually create almost what look like wooden boxes, new uh, type boxes. They put some frames up there and they just hope some bees move into it. This would be really good if you're living in a neighborhood in which you know there's a lot of other beekeepers. That'd be a great way to help out the swarm thing, right? In my neighborhood, I have so many, I think I might be the only beekeeper for at least a few miles. And as you know, bees fly three to five, not so much when they're swarming. They only, uh, I would say, typically when they're swarming, they're, the initial fly out is within hundreds of yards. And then from there, they figure out where their new home's gonna be, and then they put it in the distance. So those are some of the options, and again, it's just it's all about your attitude with the swarm. So here's the deal. You wake up one day, and your bees are swarming. Oh my god. What do you do? Sound the alarm? The swarm. We have visual contact. Identify a black mass. A moving black mass. We have been invaded by an enemy far more lethal than any human force. They've got all season to do their thing. They've got their, the whole season to build up brood and build up a strong colony and collect enough resources so that they can make it through the winter. As you start getting into June, still good, uh, you know, not so much of a nectar flow as we go in, but still, I'll take a swarm any time in June. I've still got time to either feed it or maybe the, some of the blooming towards the end of June, first part of July, and there's still a good chance they're going to make it through the winter. They'll build up, be able to build up enough resources. But the challenge is, you have a swarm in July, <coughs> September, October, no way, although they typically aren't going to swarm that late. The later you go in the season, the less chance they're going to have of being able to build up the resources necessary to make it through the winter. I mean, that's the whole game they play, isn't it? They, they, they're real small when they get started in their hive in the beginning of the year because they're just coming off the winter. They, spend the sp they, they start ramping up, the queen starts laying more eggs. The more and more workers, because now the eggs start hatching, more and more workers are out. Now things start coming into bloom. We get the nectar flows. We, they start growing in population, get up around 60, 70, 80,000 bees as the summer wears on. But then the cycle begins to wane. When you start getting into August, they start winding down. October, not a lot of, not a lot of bloom, not a lot of nectar. The queen starts slowing down her egg laying. The, uh, about September, October, you'll see the bees kick out the drones kind of a drag to be a male in the bee society because the drones get kicked out and literally you can watch the, the workers push the drones out and not let them back into the hive. They're pushed out to die. Why? Because they're here for one thing and one thing only and that doesn't happen in the winter. So all they're there to do, all they would be doing is consuming resources. So they're all kicked out. 
the hive gets small, the cluster gets small and tight, and now all the queen is doing is laying just enough eggs and just enough brood so that there's enough workers to take care of the hive throughout the winter. And then, of course, you come into the spring and start all over again. So that's sort of the, the quick cycle. So that's why, depending on when your uh, when you get a swarm or when your hive swarm is whether of what value it's going to be. So uh, and so, where did the swarm land? So hopefully, in the pictures that I showed you. The swarm may have landed on your neighbor's fence real low, or on one of your small trees that you just planted. That's great. Yeah, in your dreams. It's always happening at the, at the worst place. It's happening at the top of the telephone pole, where it's happening high up in a tree. But assess that. So high, how, how high and on what surface? So you get a bunch of bees on the side of a brick building. That's a little delicate. You know, it's hard to scrape those guys off without hurting them. Uh, if you get them on a branch, then you just clip off the whole branch and put the whole branch in your box. That's pretty handy. Doesn't happen often enough. Um, and so now you're, you know, and so the other thing you want to do is when you go after the swarm, look out for dangers for yourself. I mean, don't just run up there with your ladder and say, okay, I'm going after it, and you're climbing up the telephone pole and at the top of the big power transformer. Don't be doing that. So take a moment, take a breath, take a step back, say, okay, if I'm going to collect the swarm, how can I safely do it? Yes, I want to get the freebies. I get that. But I also, it's not worth dying over. It's not falling out of the ladder and breaking my leg over. So uh, take a look at the situation first. Yes? Hi, um, vacuum cleaners. Do you recommend them? And which ones do you recommend? Not Dyson. Dyson does not make a good uh, <laughs> So So as far as those things, so I'll show you a vacuum cleaner here. So one way to do it is just with a bucket on a pole. This is a pretty safe way. I've got one of these rigs. You can carry that in the back of your car, so that way if uh, somebody calls and says they've got a swarm, you can just put, quickly put that together. So that's pretty good. But here again, if they're on a flat surface, that's not going to work so much. Here's the vacuum cleaner idea that you were talking about. Not just any shop vac. You do have to put together a little system so that the bees get gently sucked in, into a box, separate from the whole rest of the vacuum system. Uh, one of, again, one of the cool things about beekeeping is we've got a lot of gadget freaks. And so as you attend some of the club meetings, some of our members will bring in their gadgets. And we're, they're all proud of these gadgets. They come up with a super wamperdine looking BVAC thing. And they're more than happy to share with you how they built it, the parts they needed, and when they did to put it together. So, uh, so yeah, BVACuum is an awesome thing to have. Uh, sometimes it can be this easy, where all you need is the box. And you just walk up and kind of escort them in, and off you go. You've got a whole other colony. But here again, uh, happens all too few, uh, not as much as you'd like. So now that you've caught your swarm, so you've watched your colony, you've seen the conditions, you've seen the time of year and the nectar flow, and so you finally get to a point where you say, okay, they've swarmed, now what do we do? Yes? Once they're in a swarm, are they, how, how is it long do they typically stay in that mass? Great question. So what happens is when they swarm, and if it's a prime, and so primary swarm take a queen with them, they go out in mass and they hang out somewhere. Usually they're going to be there typically from about 12 to 24 hours because remember they have no resources other than what they brought with them. They got their little batch packs. That's all they got with them. They um, they're out in the, they're out in the open, so not a lot of shelter. And what they want to do is get there and as quickly as possible decide where their new home is going to be. So this isn't one of those things that if you see a swarm in a tree that you go do something else for five or six hours. If you see a swarm in a tree, you want to get on it because they could be there from they could be there from just a couple of hours up to maybe a day or two, but typically not not too much more than that. Um, so one of the things I didn't touch base on was that. How aggressive do you think those bees are when they're swarming? When they're out there hanging on the little branch, getting ready to find another home, are they very aggressive? No. No. Not no. Really. no. So that's why when people talk about the swarm moving in and oh my god, the world's gonna come to an end, they're all happy they're all happy in that they're they're full. They've just gorged on all the on the honey. So their number one job after they swarmed is we gotta find a new home. You know, where the heck is a real estate broker when you need one? We need a new home. So they're not, they're not going to be aggressive. Now, could you go up and mess with them and get stung? Absolutely. But I would suggest if you approach a, uh, a swarm gently and easily and slowly work them uh, in the way that you want to, they're typically not going to give you much of a hard time. Not to say you won't get the gnarly ones from time to time, but for the most part, you can get in and work them. 
So, uh, now you've caught your swarm. So they've done their swarm thing, and now you've caught the swarm. So now what are we going to do with it? Well, a lot of what you're going to do with it depends on the time here that they swarm. Going back to, if it's a swarm that you got in May or June, that could be another colony for you. But on the other hand, if it's a swarm that you're capturing that's in maybe July or August, maybe not, because remember they left behind a wheat colony, and they're a wheat colony, they're never going to make it through the winter. So one of the things you may want to consider is either combining it back to the colony it came from, or combining it with a weaker colony. And there's a process you go through to do that. Obviously, if you're going to try to combine it back with the colony they just came from, well, they prepared for their departure by creating another queen or creating swarm cells. You're going to need to go in and address those because you can't have, you can't have two queens in a, in a hive. Um, or if you're going to put it back on a weaker colony, you're going to have an extra queen in there you're going to have to do something about. So that's when you break out your queen retirement box and kind of figure that whole thing out. And you don't do that. I'm being facetious. Most, most people just pinch them. Not, not what I would do. So, um, so you can combine it back as well. The others you can start a nuke. Again, if it's early in the year, just take those little dudes, put them in a little nuke box uh, with five frames or so, and just get them going, get them all situated. Then as they grow out of that, put them into another brood box and start building another colony. So that's, uh, so that's a good one. So, when you, so regardless, though, when you capture that, that swarm, it's just like getting a package of bees, isn't it? You've got to, so your package of bees. When it arrives, it'll have the queen, which the swarm has. It'll have a canister of food, which the bees don't bring with them, but they've got it in their bellies, right? They've got all the food that they need for a couple of days, but they've got no home. So what you'll want to do is get them into a home and then feed the heck out of them. Because, it, like I say, it's just like a brand new colony, just like you're going to be told to do when you get your packages, you're going to want to feed, feed, feed when you, when you first install your packages. So that they can draw out the cones, so they can begin to set up uh, housekeeping. Okay. So they send out scouts to go find a new home. So if it's up too high and you had a box to put there with the lemon or some kind of moment, would they be drawn to it? Is it within your area? So, so great, great question. I've got a, a, a video here at the end that I'll show, but what happens is when they go out, and there's a guy by the name of Dr. Thomas Seeley that has done a lot of study on this. So the bees do their swarm thing, and now they're hanging on the side of a fence somewhere. And so they're saying, okay, we need to find a home. So indeed, they send out scouts. And these scouts go out in different directions, and they look at possible contenders for a new home. And so if you put up a swarm trap or uh, you, you strap a nuke to a tree somehow, hopefully the scout bees will find that. And then in the Honeybee Democracy, which again is a book that Dr. Seeley wrote, he talks about how the bees actually come to an agreement in a democratic fashion about which hive is the best hive for them to go to. So, um, so he'll do a better um, job here in a moment on the video, but just to give you the quick rundown, the bees go out and scout, you'll have four bees that come back. And they each tell the rest of the bees, I found a good place. And they do a little dance. And they do a little waggle dance in a certain area. And it tells, it, it communicates to the other bees, hey, dude, I think this is a really great place. It's got four bedrooms, three baths, and 1,400 square feet. And so what they do is they tell each other where, they, where the conditions of the new hive could be, where it's located directionally, and then they... Then a couple more scouts will go out and check out, and they'll come back. And so now you'll have 10 bees promoting one location. Another location is only getting two bees promoting. And so before you know it, enough scouts have gone out and checked out. Now you've got a bunch of people voting and saying, or a bunch of bees voting and saying, hey, this is a really good location. And that's when the whole swarm takes off and goes to the new location. So it's pretty fascinating. Again, this is one of those topics that you could spend a whole day just talking about this morning. Yes. I'm going to go ahead and ask a dumb question here. You said you said bees when they swarm they usually don't go very far, right? Like you, you said you're pretty much the the sole beekeeper within a, within a mile area, uh, within, within a few miles. If you know there's another beekeeper a couple blocks down from you and you see a swarm, is there some kind of bee etiquette? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, uh, oh, this might be my neighbor's bees that left his hide, you know. Like, you know what I so, mean? you know, if, I, if there was a beekeeper down at the end of the road, and I knew mine didn't swarm and his, and his might have, I want to get along with all my neighbors. I'd probably get them a call and say, hey, Joe, I got a swarm here. One of your hives swarm. And I'd probably help him catch it. 
But I mean, is um, that common among people? Oh, beekeepers work real well together. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no. One beekeeper is going to try to put something over on you. But on the other hand, if I don't know any beekeepers and there's and there's a swarm near my yard, totally yeah, mine. Right. I'm all over. Yeah. 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 Right. So uh, it's not like I'm gonna, the guy's going to come up and I'm going to say, okay, describe the bees to me. How do you work? Ted. Something, something you'll find out, it'll be hard to do your first year if you're starting from scratch, but subsequently, when you have a swarm, one of the most valuable things that you can possibly give your bees is a frame of drawn out comb. Because they don't, if you put them in a box, they don't, all they have is a box. They don't really have a home yet, and they're going to have to make that by basically turning, turning um, honey into wax. If you can give them a head start, if you can give them one frame of comb, that gets them so far ahead because the queen can immediately begin laying, they can immediately begin doing the stuff that they do to be bees. And it just, it, it's, it's an enormous, it's an enormous leg up for them. Okay, so again, now that you've caught your swarm, what are you going to do with it? Uh, if you do turn it into a separate colony, feed it, feed it, feed it. So at the end of the day, there's no hard and fast rules about how to do this thing. The point is to enjoy the moment and identify this as the opportunity that it is. It's not a scary thing. It's a fun thing. It's an amazing thing of nature. And it could create a great opportunity for you as a beekeeper because of all the, all the pros that we talked about a little bit earlier. So this little uh, eight minute or so video is beyond the basics. And this is Dr. Tom Seeley that you're going to see talking. And he's going to show you, essentially what he did is he went out on an island that had no, hardly any trees and no bee population, and he brought bees with him. And then he set up targets and watched the bees swarm, and he created safe zones for the bees to swarm to. And then they could sit and watch and observe that swarm before it chose its next house. So what you're going to see are the targets that the bees land on, and then uh, he's got all his students to sit there and take notes about what they do and how they do it. So pretty fascinating stuff. <laughs> about eight minutes. Conduct their, their search for a new home, which actually takes at least a few hours, and sometimes a So we can also try this, if you guys are really open to it, is I, while we're talking, I'll uh, set up a wireless hotspot. So who has questions about um, anything that we've covered? Oh, and here we go. Okay, so we'll start back here and we'll, we'll work that way. If you find a swarm, I assume it's going to have a queen. How do you know if she's a maiden? Is she always going to be maiden? Yeah, because she will have been in the hive all the way up to date. And so she would be a maiden queen because if the, if the, if the hive had no brood, because she wasn't yet mated, I don't know that they would, they would swarm because they don't have... Part of the swarming process is they have to have enough brood left behind so that who they leave behind can start a new queen. And if she was not a mated queen, she wouldn't have laid anything behind. And so I don't think a hive would swarm with a non-mated queen. Now, in a primary swarm. Now, what could happen is, on a secondary or, or, or a later swarm, I'm, I suppose there could be that instance in which the queen is hatched and she never got mated, and for whatever reason they decided to swarm again. So I suppose that could happen, because odd things happen. But typically, especially in your primary swarm, it's going to be a maiden queen. Other questions? Maiden queen. Uh, you said that you're having a facetious about this, but you said that you keep it uh, 
that you have like a queen retirement thing at your, at your place? Uh -huh. Is that for real? Yeah, so uh, so whenever I have a queen that isn't performing so well, uh, the agreement I have with my, my bride is that I will put her in a nuke and try to start a split with her. Okay. And so, so yeah, that's for real. So I, you know, yeah. So, and just, so sometimes, I, so, so sometimes we think we're smarter than these, so we're totally not. But so I'll get in there and I'll say, wow, I think this queen is failing. Well, turns out she's not failing, it's just me, I don't know what's going on. And so, um, and so I, the first year I did that, and actually she did really well. So I shouldn't have been pitching her anyway. So it turned out. So, so rule number one, always listen to your wife. Happy wife, happy life. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that's how it goes. Uh, next question, yes. So if you knew that you were going to have a swarming coming to you, you saw those guys show up, would you give yourself a lot of trouble if you would just set up a swarm trap so that would be totally ideal. Yep. Doesn't always happen that way. They yeah, and I, I know a lot of times people will do they'll do trees and small brush bushes and stuff in front of their hives in the hope that when they swarm it'll collect there. But um, you know best. What are the best laid plans of my and men kind of deal? So I don't think I'm going to be able to get this thing Frank, going. There's a hot spot right here, Frank. There's a hot spot in this building. KCPFW. Show swarm intelligence par excellence because they're a group of bees that are homeless and they have a very important decision to make. They have to decide where their new home is going to be. And they bring to the to this task the fact that they've got several the swarm as a whole has about 10,000 worker bees and one queen bee in it. Of those 10,000 or so bees, only a few hundred are actually involved in the decision making. But still, when you think about it, that's several hundred bees that could go searching far and wide for potential home sites, which would be cavities and trees. And it's several hundred individuals, not just one, that can then debate about, it, debate the possibilities, kick the ideas around, and decide among themselves through debate which one is actually the best. I think you can see that, that that's a, a very powerful way to make a decision. If you've got a group of individuals that are cooperative, willing to work together to find, find the options, talk about the options, identify the best one, and then agree to go forward with the best, the one that's the best choice. So that's what we call sworn intelligence. I like to investigate it with a real sword, a sword of bees. Okay, so that was the abbreviated version. Um, <laughs> go, on, go on to YouTube and look up Thomas Seeley, and you can find a lot of this great stuff. Or get the book on democracy, which is some awesome book to read. So with that, I'm going to wrap up the class part, and we're going to get into the club part. And so Ted, I think you're on. I have an announcement I'd like to make before we proceed. Uh, we're going to have an apiary playtime next week before class at, at Stedman's in the apiary, which, if you're not familiar with it, is behind the gift shop. Stedman's is down in the yellow building out at the very end by the tree. It will be out and behind there where the apiary is. I'm going to try to be there. I'll be there by 4 30. I'll try to be there at 4, but I may not be there at 4 30. Everybody's welcome to come, bring your veils. We're going to play with live bees and we will get some. Or I will get some, and you can all laugh at me. Uh, we're going to do this this coming Tuesday and the following Tuesday, so for the last, the last two classes. And if you have any questions, send me an email. Uh, we're, I'll be there by 4.30.